Hello and welcome everybody. We're just waiting for another minute for our attendees to join and um, we'll begin at two o'clock. So hi everyone and um, welcome to the first of our Putting into Practice Land Rights and Responsibilities webinar series. Um, my name is Kirsty Tate, I'm a Good Practice Advisor with the Scottish Land Commission and I'm going to hand over to my colleagues who will quickly introduce themselves now. Hi. Hi, I'm Helen Botton. I'm also a Good Practice Advisor and I'm going to be presenting the, some work around two of our protocols with Kirsty this afternoon. Hi everyone, I'm Emma Cooper, the Head of Land Rights and Responsibilities for the Land Commission. Hi, I'm Gemma Campbell. I'm the Good Practice Manager for the Land Commission. Okay, I'm just going to go through a bit of the housekeeping for today. So just to let you all know that this webinar is being recorded and will be available to view and share on our YouTube channel. Question and answers. Thank you all for posing your questions on registration. Please also use our question and an answer function through the session. Emma will be monitoring this and we'll also collect all your questions and write up answers to share with you after this webinar. Um, in terms of feedback, we really appreciate your feedback to this webinar. A short feedback form will be emailed to you to fill after the session, so please do fill and send this back to us. And finally, if you want to tweet, please do use our very snappy title, uh, hashtag Land Rights and Responsibilities. Um, Emma will post this up on chat, so you can just copy and paste. So let's find out a bit about you and um, we're going to run a quick poll. So if you just take a minute or so to complete this and we can find out where you're all from and why you're attending our webinar. Okay, we're just ending the poll. And we have the shared results. So can everyone, hopefully everyone can see this on their screens. So we have 10% from Aberdeen and Northeast, 27% from the Highlands and Islands, 13% of you are from Tayside Central and Fife, 18% from the Edinburgh Lothians, 21% from Glasgow and Strathclyde and 12% from the South of Scotland. So a good mix, a good balance from across Scotland. So great to see you all here. And I'll hand over to Helen to look at yeah. why you're attending. Yeah, really pleased to see that cross section because what we're talking about applies across all of Scotland and it applies in the rural and the urban areas. So it's great to see that mix. Why you're attending, I mean, some of you will have ticked more than one because people don't necessarily just have wear one hat or, or have one interest, but um, certainly most of you are here because you're interested in land reform which you're you're in the right place you've come to the right to the right place um some of you eight percent own land and want to learn more and the others a mixture of people working with people who own land or who manage land and also 26 percent who represent the community really pleased to see that mix because what we're talking about applies to 
people in communities and it applies to people who own and manage land and when we start to talk about the protocols in detail we'll we'll talk through why that's that's important for to have that mix and to get that representation so that's great thank you all for completing that poll and kicking us off okay, so hand back to Kirsty. Go on. <laughs> So what are we going to cover today? Um, we're going to start with an introduction to the Land Rights and Responsible Statement and the Good Practice Programme here at the Commission. We're then going to give an overview of the protocols that are the subject for today, um, looking at community engagement and transparency in ownership and use. We'll then give a quick introduction to our Land Rights and Responsibility self-assessment, our in-house online training workshop offer, and finally, the rest of the dates for this series uh, webinar series. So moving on to start with, um, the Land Rights and Responsible Statement published by the Scottish Government is the first of its kind in the world. This sets out a strong and dynamic, a vision for a strong and dynamic relationship between Scotland's land and its people. The decisions we make about land ownership, use and management are central to some of the key challenges we face, including social and economic inequality and the climate emergency and also right now, our country's post-pandemic recovery and renewal. This is about realising the rights of everyone in relation to land, not just property rights, and the responsibilities that come for all of us with these land rights. Land rights and responsibilities are about owning, managing and using land in a fair and just way that benefits everyone in Scotland. Realising and applying these can reduce inequality and help bring mutual benefit to landowners, land managers and communities alike. The statement's vision and six mutually supportive principles underpins our work here at the Commission and provides us with the legislative context in supporting change and good practice in the way our land is owned and used. As we said, land rights and responsibilities apply to both urban and rural Scotland. And the key changes sought are that the overall framework of land rights responsibilities should promote, fulfil and respect relevant human rights, contribute to public interest and well-being and balance public and private interests. There should be greater diversity, diversity in ownership of land, including more community ownership. High standards of stewardship of land should be exercised, as well as high standards, standards of transparency of land ownership and use. And finally, better community engagement in decisions about land. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Helen, who will tell you more about our Good Practice Programme and our protocol approach. So here at the Scottish Land Commission, we have a key role to play in developing and realising those principles that Kirsty has just outlined from the statement to help to drive the culture change that's needed to make more of Scotland's land for all of us. So our good practice programme has been designed to provide a coordinated approach to encourage and help anybody with an interest in land to both recognise and fulfil their rights and responsibilities in very practical ways. We're working with a good practice advisory group of key sector representatives to co-produce protocols, guidance, training and to develop land rights and responsibilities self-assessment. Core membership of the group includes representatives from Community Land Scotland, Development Trusts Association Scotland, National Farmers Union Scotland, Scottish Land and Escape Estates, the Scottish Pro Pro Property Federation and Scottish Environment Link. But we also engage with and involve various other organisations where they have particular experience and expertise to draw on. And some of our, you I know uh, joined us here this afternoon. You're very welcome. We also offer an advice and casework service which supports the implementation and the expectations that we set out in our protocols. Where appropriate, we'll provide advice and engage with relevant parties to help them find mutual resolutions and improvements in practice. We'll discuss two of our protocols next and tell you more about the self-assessment and the opportunities to get involved with these later. So what are our protocols? Um, as Kirsty outlined, there are six 
principles within the land rights and responsibilities statement which cover um, a, a, how owners and managers of land can contribute to human rights and public interest, diversity, community opportunities for ownership, um, high standards of stewardship, transparency and greater community engagement. And we're going to talk about the, the last two of those in particular this afternoon. So the protocols are being developed to support each of those six principles and they set out clear expectations about how land rights and responsibilities should be implemented and they can also be used to hold behaviour to account. They will help us to at the Land Commission to collate evidence of where any further action or recommendations may need to be made to affect changes needed if, if we don't see those, those changes starting to take place. They can be used by everyone in Scotland and they're particularly useful for communities and businesses as they set out the practical ways that they can realise rights and responsibilities with regard to land in their own locality. For landowners and managers, they set out what responsible practice looks like. So they set out what, what you would hope to achieve. Applying that, that good practice can bring benefits to all parties involved though and following the protocols provides an opportunity for genuine engagement and collaboration which can reduce potential conflict and help to make all parties more resilient and also increase generation of, of new ideas and opportunities. We're going to play a very short animation now that you can also find on our, our website that summarises this approach. The Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement, published by the Scottish Government, is the first of its kind anywhere in the world and sets the vision for a strong and dynamic relationship between Scotland's land and its people. It underpins the work of the Scottish Land Commission in supporting change and good practice. Land rights and responsibilities apply to both urban and rural Scotland and aim to promote greater diversity in ownership of land, including more community ownership, high standards and transparency of land ownership and use, and better community engagement in decisions about land. We will publish protocols that will provide clarity on what is reasonably expected in implementing the Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement. These protocols will provide a transparent mechanism to support good practice. The first protocol focuses on supporting engagement and collaboration between those who own or manage land and communities, ensuring people have an opportunity to be involved in decisions about land that affect them. This is part of the plan to increase the accountability of land ownership and support a change across Scotland, where local communities and landowners work together to achieve sustainable development. We will work closely with stakeholders to develop protocols that are short, clear, practical and fair to all parties, setting out clear expectations of what normal reasonable behaviour is, and we will also provide guidance and practical advice to landowners, land managers and communities to help us make more of Scotland's land. So I'll talk now about that first protocol that was mentioned in the clip there, the protocol for community engagement in decisions relating to land. This was the first one that we published early, early last year um, and it supports principle six of the land rights and responsibilities which you'll, you'll see on the slide there which says there should be greater collaboration and community engagement in decisions about land. At the same time as the publication of the Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement, the Scottish Government also published guidance um, around the community engagement in land-based decisions and this protocol draws from a lot of the principles that, that are included in that guidance and helps to put that into, into practice. So the benefits of good engagement are that genuine and effective engagement can help to build trust between landowners and their managers, between communities and others with an interest in land locally. It builds positive and cooperative working relationships. 
and helps to foster more mutual understanding of all the issues involved for all parties. It can support communities to express themselves and become involved in decisions that affect them and can create, lead to more creative and innovative solutions to issues as more people are involved in discussing the options that might be available. Fundamentally, it can secure better economic, environmental, social and cultural outcomes for all parties. And it's about encouraging behaviour change and building productive and strong relationships. Some of you will have seen we recently published a report on the benefits of early engagement in the planning process in particular. Um, and we also have a number of case studies on our, our website that we've been collecting and will add to as time goes on. Uh, and they show some great examples of this and how people have started to put this into practice. The core ethos of the protocol is that communities can reasonably expect to be engaged in decisions about land that are going to have an impact on their communities. That the engagement should be genuine, that it's open-ended, that it's an ongoing relationship and very importantly that it's proportionate uh, both to the, to the resources, to the, the time and the money that's available to all parties but also that it's proportionate to the impact the decision might have on the community. So day-to-day -day running of land-based or, or property-based businesses might not require huge amounts of complicated engagement all the time. Bigger proposals will, uh, and our guidance sets out the sorts of examples of, of, of how, that, how that will happen. So the, the key expectations that are set out in the protocol um, set out what can reasonably be expected from all parties that are involved. So for people who are making decisions about how land and buildings in Scotland are used and managed, the key expectations for them are that contact information is always readily available, that you take into account how your decisions will impact people in the community and take steps to make sure that those who are going to be affected know about your plans, can find out more and can have a say if they want to. We expect that you will take community views into account along with your other business considerations and most importantly that you let people know the outcome, that they know how those decisions will be made and what the decision has, has been at the end. But there are also responsible responsibilities for communities because these protocols are reciprocal. So communities should also make sure that their community organisations have their contact details readily available, um, that they help everyone in the community to have a voice, that it's not just the most confident or those who can shout loudest that get their views ac across, uh, and that they know what the views of their the broad views of their community are and, and, and where possible that you know what your, your future plans are so that landowners and land managers know how their plans can, can help to support that. And in general we expect everybody to listen to all views and to be prepared to enter into constructive dialogue with each other. We've created a range of tools that support those that, who are engaging with, with communities to, to do this. It includes a route map. If you see that, many of you will already have this up on your walls. We've seen it uh, when we were able to get out and about in, in offices all over Scotland, but it's also available on, on our website. All these, all these resources are available on our, on our website for, and can be downloaded. We've got guidance about how to develop engagement plans, the sorts of methods that are appropriate and what's expected in different situations, um, as well as practical guides to support the process and case studies about what other people have tried and what they've done elsewhere. So just now I'm going to refer back to Emma who has been closely watching the questions that have been coming in and also looking at the questions that were submitted to us in advance. Um, so what's been coming in Emma? Have we got some interesting questions around community engagement? 
We do, we always do. Uh, thanks, Helen. So the, the first question I've got for you was asked before the session, and it's the protocol talks about significant impact of decisions. So how do we know if a land use decision will have a significant impact? What's the definition there? Okay, I'll come in on this. Um, this is very much dependent on the local context and individual circumstances. However, the Scottish Government and ourselves have offered useful broad guidelines. Um, the route map that Helen showed earlier actually takes you through step by step about the decisions and if they're moderate, significant or day to day decisions. So when we talk about significant, what we mean is something that maybe impacts on the human rights of other people, including their economic, social and cultural rights, for example. It might affect several people in the local population, not just one household. Um, it could impact positive, positively or negatively on opportunities for sustainable local development. Or it could simply be a series of small decisions about land whose individual impact might not appear significant, but over time this actually accumulates. So in terms of examples on our route map, what we actually show is these decisions that might have significant impact include activities such as on housing supply, essential services, local jobs, or social environmental issues. It won't normally include your day-to-day -day activities, but some of these activities might have moderate impacts if they become more disruptive uh, than usual. So maybe if they affect transport or business locally, or if they're causing light, smell, or sound pollution. But as I say, it's very much down to the local context and to actually understand this, we encourage very early engagement and work alongside communities to actually understand your community and what actually would impact on that. So it is very much down to local circumstance, but there are broad guidelines that we put out there. That's great. Okay, uh, second question that's come in. Could you provide an example of where communi uh, community engagement results in the representation of local people? So some examples of good community engagement. We have some fantastic case studies um, on our website at the moment. Um, perhaps <laughs> the one that's um, most in public eye at the moment is actually the Langham Moor sale and Buclou. And um, in terms of the pre-sale community engagement, we actually do hold that up as an example of good practice. Um, when Buclou came to the Langham Moor sale, they, just, they, they, they wanted to engage the community on this. So they put the sale on hold and they ran a series of consultation events to actually find out how the sale of that land would impact the local community, but also find out if there was local community interest in ownership of that land. And we are at the point where we are now, and um, through that consultation and communities having their voice, there was, there is an interest in ownership of that land. And that is going through the process now of negotiated sale. But I think for me, that was probably quite a, a really good example in terms of a land use decision that has a significant impact like a land sale and actually how you can run effective community engagement and hear the what the community think about that sale and how it impacts them, but also the opportunities that Buclou weren't, uh, weren't aware of before they actually ran the consultation events. I believe that the community is still looking for financial support for that, Kirsty, is that right? And there's they a community are, share option think, uh, yeah. or crowd <laughs> fundraising online. Yeah. <laughs> Many of you might have seen the Channel 4 support. report. Yes, yeah, so they are, they're actively, the Langham um, community are actively looking for um, crowdfunding to buy but the new Castleton Home Hill um, negotiated sale is well on its way and hopefully will be concluded um, by autumn this year so it's uh, it's positive there's challenges I'm not you know I'm not saying there's not challenges however I think giving the time and a landowner giving the time to actually hear the community's views and enable opportunities is a positive move forward. Great okay so we should say that we're going to answer all the questions that you submit today and we'll circulate those answers by email. Do you want another question live? Have we got time? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Yeah. Yeah, one more. Um, so 
Alison Martin is asking, saying that the land rights and responsibilities principle, this one, is quite a departure from how some decisions have been made in the past for some land uses. How is it being received specifically by landowners? I can maybe come in there and just refer back to some uh, a, a couple of surveys that we did at the end of of last year um because we did we we wanted to try and find out what's what's our baseline what are what are we working from here so that we can track whether things are changing or not um, and we did two surveys one was to ask owners and managers of land what their what their views of community engagement were and and how they were receiving that and one to ask community organizations similar questions that so we got both both perspectives i would say when we've been talking to out talking to to land agents and talking to landowners and and people who work for them some landowners and managers are quite nervous about what's expected um, but in general the protocols have been welcomed in setting out clearly what's expected of them and what the what the standards are that we're that we're hoping that that they will that they will reach and we're seeing actually quite uh, that there are there are some challenges but generally we're seeing a willingness for landowners to work with us and also to work with with their communities there are responsibilities for communities as well um, and one of the questions asked about representation of communities and there I would I would I would say that there are there is an onus on communities to make sure that they are representative of themselves and that community organizations are supported to be to be able to do that because it's very difficult for landowners and managers who genuinely want to take community engagement forward to do that if if they're talking to to um, sort of less organized groups of, of individuals it's much easier to work with organized bodies who as far as possible can represent the the broad opinions within that community given that no community will agree on on everything but to, to try and sort of represent the, the broad opinions and broad representative views within within local communities thanks helen do you want to carry on with Q&A or do you want to we move can. forward? We can, we've got five, yeah, yeah we've got, yeah, we've we've got, got we're we ahead of time, so we've done well. <laughs> Brilliant, okay. Uh, so we have another question here, which is from Lucy, and it says that, I assume that Forest and Land Scotland and other public bodies who own land should also be adhering to the land rights and responsibilities statement at a local level. What can a community do if they do not believe that they are? I mean, yes, all public bodies are or do have to follow the land rights and responsibilities statement and Forest and Land Scotland have their own very specific and um, inform yeah, quite considerable community engagement guidance. Um, however, if there is a case where you feel um, the, the expectations aren't being followed, you can get in contact with us and we can help to support and hopefully find a solution to that issue. That is what some our protocols open up. But I am, yes, all public bodies are do have to follow the land rights and responsibilities statement. And maybe worth picking up a, a question that's 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 come in that I'm just seeing that's come in earlier on there about what the potential consequences might be and it's it's worth stressing that these protocols are voluntary um, they're all voluntary expectations but they set out what the Scottish government have very clearly stated in the land rights and responsibilities that statement and in the guidance on engaging communities as their expected behaviors um, so they're all voluntary and we our work would be to support people in a voluntary capacity to to broker agreements or to to try and to try and improve improve behaviors i made a reference earlier to um, potential future recommendations and and there's there's nothing sinister in that i mean the government have been very clear that that uh, um, from the outset that after three years they will expect the guidance to be reviewed and they will be looking to the Scottish Land Commission to to be part of that review um, and to feed in our experience from our casework and our um, and and the approaches that we get from from the protocols to to gauge then whether any further or 
powers or whether whether any statutory powers might might be required can't say at this stage whether that will be required or not because we're still we're still working on a very very voluntary process um, and that's actually what we would like to encourage and what the stakeholders who work with us want to encourage with their members as well that we bring people with us that it's something that people want to do and it's something that people see the benefit of doing because it's it's the right thing to do and because there are benefits for everybody involved in in doing that um, so yeah that's that's how we will take them forward thanks helen okay lynn divine has also asked about common good land which has its own challenges do you have any examples of successful transfers and are there any specific protocols re relating to common good land? So that's it's quite timely. Um, there will be a pro we will be producing our protocol on common good land, and we've actually um, done quite a lot of research for, um, surrounding this, and um, put forward recommendations. So do watch this space. We are working with local authorities and stakeholders on this. Um, the, the aim is that once, um, obviously, we have issues, everyone has issues with this pandemic and with the capacity, and once things get back to normal, um, <laughs> um, we will be working with local authorities on this, uh, so watch this space. Okay, so I think, yeah, we're going to move on now. Um, thank you, everyone, for your questions, and we hope we found that, you found that helpful. As I say, we will be collating all of these, so please do, do not worry if your questions haven't been answered. Um, we'll be collating the, all of these after the webinar and sharing, this, sharing the answers with you and hopefully be able to signpost and help you in any way we can. So we're going to move on to the second protocol now, and this protocol focuses on um, transparency of ownership and land use decision making. And this follows the Land Rights Responsibility Statement Principle 5, which states that there should be improved transparency of information about the ownership, use and management of land. And this should be publicly available, clear and contain relevant details. So our protocol sets out the information that should be provided by landowners and managers to help improve the transparency and understanding of who owns land in Scotland and what it's used for. Why is this important? Well, it has been recognised that a lack of transparency about land ownership and land use decision making is a barrier to dialogue and progress. Information about land and buildings provides the foundation for open and transparent decision making and can enable, can enable greater participation, which is one of the key elements of the human rights framework. Improved information about who controls land in Scotland will help empower people and communities and give them the opportunity to understand who is in control of the land. So the Scottish Government has invited the Keeper of the Register to complete the land registry by 2024. In the next few years, landowners and managers will have to contribute, contribute to both the land register and a new register of persons controlling, holding a controlled interest in land. This will lead to better quality and more accessible information about land for all of Scotland. You can find out more about their work by visiting the website www.ros.gov.uk. It's a very accessible and easy to navigate site and staff there are very happy to help with inquiries. So why have we published this protocol now? Ahead of the establishment and completion of these registers, this protocol sets out reasonable expectations of the information to be provided by those who own and manage land in Scotland. Information about the ownership, use and management of land should be available to those who could be impacted by the decisions made about that land. So let's look into more depth about the ethos and the specific expectations. So in terms of specific expectations contained in the protocol, what we set out is the up-to-date information about who owns land on buildings and the extent of the land holding should always be publicly available. If there are people or bodies with significant influence and control over land and buildings, information about who they are and the extent of their control should be made publicly available, along with information about ownership. 
As we said before, contact information for the landowner manager and any relevant community council or community organisation should also be available. Other expectations include landowners making use of the registers of Scotland's processes for voluntary registration on land holdings. Landowners and managers preparing a summary of land use and management which should be publicly available. So to support this we've actually developed a template um, that you can use and this is available on our website. This template um, provides information about the ownership and use of land, detailing who owns the land, their plans for it and how communities can get in touch with them. So that was a quick run through that protocol. So we'll hand over to Emma again to um, bring in some of the questions that have been asked around transparency. Thanks, Kirsty. So the first question is, where can I currently find out who owns land? Okay, well, I'll, I'll pick that up. Um, Kirsty mentioned they're the registers of Scotland who keep public registers of land and we can, we can send that, that link out when we send answers to the questions out after the webinar, we can make sure that that link is, is included. Um, so the registers of Scotland keep public registers of land and property and other legal documents in Scotland. Um, the, the general register of say signs dates back, would you believe, to 1617. So it goes a long, a long way back. It's the oldest national public land register in, in the world. But since 1981, a map based land register was was introduced. And between the two registers, the majority of of property in Scotland is is detailed. But it will take some time, obviously, for all the property that was held on the original register to be transferred over to the to the new register. The land register currently has, I believe, about 1.6 million properties and there are further 1.1 million properties still on the register of say signs. So more information can be found at the website www.ros.gov.uk. It's very accessible, very easy. To, to, to navigate um, and the, the Scottish Government has invited the register keepers to complete the land register by 2024. So it is a work in process but between the two registers most, most of the land in Scotland can, can be found. Okay, we're not getting any more live questions about the transparency <laughs> protocol. You're obviously far too thorough in your presentation. <laughs> Do you want another couple of questions on community engagement? We've got a fresh one here. <laughs> yeah, let's yeah, go, go for it. it. Yeah, okay. So uh, Kenneth Thompson is asking, how should community engagement involve or not involve A, local bodies such as community councils, business associations, planning authorities, etc. And B, non-local communities such as walking groups, nearby towns, foreign visitors. You catch that all? <laughs> Yeah, well, well, our our um, focus is is particularly on communities of place. So people who live, work um, in a in a in a local area. We frustratingly, for some people, don't set specific definitions of that because it varies in each circumstance. But when we've asked in surveys, what how people identify their community, there are some fairly standard uh, responses that come back or so some, some fairly common responses that come back. So generally we find people are able to identify for themselves what their community is, whether it's a village, whether it's an estate, whether it's an area within a, an urban area within a town, it, it may be particular streets within, a, within an urban envir environment. So we would be looking for the engagement to draw to to contact people who live within live and work particularly within that community who are going to be impacted by any change in use or or decisions about how land and buildings are going to be going to be used that doesn't mean that communities of interest should be ignored there there will be circumstances where they've got 
very valid input and very very valid concerns so creations of mountain bike trails for example or creations of access paths you will want to speak to the people who are going to be using those trails and paths so you will you will want to to speak to those communities of interest you might want to get particular expertise um, specific expertise in to help you make your your decisions but in terms of community organizations when Kenneth you've you've mentioned a few of the, the typical types of community organizations where they exist community councils are a good starting point because they do have statutory representative responsibilities so they're always a good starting point where they exist but there may also be other organizations there may be local development trusts there may be resident associations um, you've mentioned business associations so um, uh, the the guidance that we set out sort of helps gives gives some advice on at at the beginning before you even start your engagement doing some mapping out of who your community are, who's involved, how do you reach the different sectors of that community? Have you got uh, older people? Have you got young people who you wouldn't normally hear from? Do you need to be thinking about how you can contact them and how they can have a, a voice and how they can express a view on proposals that are being put forward? So it's not a one size fits all. Uh, it would be easy to give an answer if it was, but it would be the wrong answer because it will it will vary depending on your local circumstances and depending on your own community. OK, a couple more questions on transparency now. So firstly, do landowners have a responsibility to provide details to communities about land that they own and which a group is interested in, but details of which are not yet available on the register? As part of uh, the transparency protocol, one of the uh, resources that we've developed is a template to support landowners and managers to provide information about their land and who owns it and their plans for it and how communities can get in touch if they want if they want to know more about it. So for I mean for individual owners doing that on a voluntary basis before the formal registration is required gives greater certainty and security about what's owned um, but it also can also help to to um, speed up processes and uh, help communities be better informed about the land and who's who holds it um, and where to make contact if they've got an interest that they want want to take forward so the responsibility is a voluntary responsibility but it will become a statutory responsibility so this protocol and the resources that we've developed with 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 input from other stakeholders will help people to work will help landowners and help land managers to work their way through that and see what 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 a, a good standard of information would be that they can make available now to, to mm -hmm. for themselves but also to help communities that they're working with Okay. Another question related to that is, if a community is looking to register an interest in land or otherwise influence land use, should they also use or publish the transparency template which you mentioned? I'm happy to come in on that one yeah. if you like. Um, the, the template that we've um, published is really to give a framework for landowners to, to help them share some basic information about what they do. Um, in terms of uh, community register registration of interest in land, um, there are particular um, criteria that they have to meet. So if they were going for um, registering community right to buy or a community right to buy abandoned, neglected or detrimental, um, they would have to demonstrate to the Scottish Government when, when they put their application into ministers that they have um, sufficient membership from the local community and that they have the support of, of the members of the community. Um, like I say, the, the template is very high level, so they could use that to give some very kind of basic details about what they plan to do with the land. But in a situation where the, they're looking to take on the land through a right to buy, um, I would suggest that they might need to share a bit more information. Um, but there are some of the elements of our community engagement work that might be really useful for communities who are going through that process. This is very much about building better relationships and I suppose everyone recognising their rights and responsibilities to the, the, 
the land that they care about. Um, so a lot of this is just good practice. And, we, you know, if if follows can make decisions a lot easier in the long run, there's benefits. So, yeah, I mean, I think um, for a community group, it's just as important to share as much as you can about your ambitions. If you have an area of land in mind and being open about these ambitions and your aspirations, and hopefully, you know, that's that's the start of a good dialogue. And this is what it's all about, is creating good dialogue and good relationships. Okay, we have one more question on this subject, which is if all information is on the land register already, why are landowners being asked to refile everything? Is any new information being sought? I, I don't think that all the information is on the land register yet. Um, so we're not asking people to provide additional information, um, but also it's about having that information open readily available so it's information that that might be filed on the land register um but without having to the, the the there are there are small fees for accessing information that's on the land register so it's about making as much as possible easily available for people that might have an interest or that that might want to have have discussions about it so it's, it's not about necessarily about new information it's just having it building up that trust and building up mm. openness for everybody that's in everybody that's concerned. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, that was a good question and answer session. We'll go through the next few slides and we might have a bit more time at the end, but we'll see how we get on for more questions. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to Helen to talk a bit about our self-assessment pilot program. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about this. The, we've, we've mentioned the, the self-assessment pilot program and I'm going to tell you a little bit more now about what's actually involved with this. So the land rights and responsibilities statement that was produced by the Scottish Government sets out vision and principles for land use and land management and land ownership across Scotland with the six key principles that we've, that we've referred to earlier. The Scottish Land Commission last year have also carried out research around issues associated with large scale and concentrated ownership of land in Scotland and made some recommendations um, as a consequence of the, the findings of that. One of those recommendations was introducing statutory reviews to ensure more account, better accountability of land holding in relation to the six principles of the land rights and responsibilities statement um, and ministers have agreed that we should do further work to develop how those reviews would be taken forward. So statutory reviews will will be for the future um, but now our team the good practice team are developing a short, a voluntary short self-assessment framework to help anyone who's making significant decisions about the way land or buildings are used or managed and assess how they might contribute already to those six principles of the Land Rights Responsibilities Statement and the protocols that we're developing to support them. So the assessment, as I say, is voluntary. It's done with support from members of our team using a simple template. The template will guide organisations to think about which of their activities contribute to developing each of those six principles, how they can evidence them, but also to reflect on where it might, improvements might be, might be made. So each landowner or organisation will connect, collect and analyse their own evidence over, over a relevant period and assess themselves on their approach to their the land management planning, their decision making and communications, um, but taking public interest priorities into consideration. So time input will vary. Um, it will vary depending on the size or the complexity of each organisation, but we don't expect it to be an onerous process. 
It's a supported self-assessment using evidence that's already available within an organization. So after some initial familiarization that we would take you through, we would expect it to take no more than a few days spread over a period of weeks. Um, but the reasonable expectations and capacity would obviously be part of, of any introductory discussion. So we're, uh, we, would, we would be really keen to talk to any owners or managers of land out there who would be interested in working with us to test this process, become an early adopter and, and help us really pilot how that framework might, might work. We're looking for people across both urban and rural settings and large or small landowners, land holdings. So if you think this is something that you'd be interested in and you would like to take part in the pilot project, then do please get in contact with us. Let us know. Um, people who have had a look at this and started to, to use test the process out so far have found that it helps them to assess and improve their own operations and governance. Uh, provide, it also provides an opportunity to highlight good practice, that lots and lots of good practice already happening out there to highlight that, to find it and to share it with other people in different sectors um, and to help inform reviews of strategic plans uh, to help evidence corporate responsibilities and to help review governance arrangements. So if anybody needs any more information or be interested in finding out more about that, then do please get in contact with us and be very happy to talk to you more about that. Okay, and I'm going to give you a quick um, overview of our in-house free online tailored workshop offers. Judging by the interest we've had in this webinar and also the amount of question and answers that are popping up at the moment, there is a wide interest in this and a wide um, interest in actually um, talking about this and understanding what it means in good practice. So we're delighted to offer these tailored online workshops. Um, before COVID hit, we actually started this workshop series, physical workshop series, um, mm -hmm. where we actually met in person. It seems like a different world now. But we ran quite um, a several across the country with land agents. And uh, we recognise how beneficial this is to take the time with different sectors to really reflect on what good practice in terms of land rights and responsibility is. So these workshops will be designed with you and we can offer the following. We, it can provide an opportunity to discuss specific cases or examples and give practical guidance. We can also cover a wider overview of the Commission's work. Obviously, our Good Practice programme is just part of the Scottish Lands Commission's work and we are involved in many areas and producing a whole book body of research and recommendations so we can we can go into more depth in that in these workshops if required we could be we're aiming we will aim to cover the whole of the land rights and responsibilities protocol series so we're working on and um, publishing these over the next couple of months so they'll be we'll have a whole series by the beginning of um, mid-september and we can also provide more detailed discussion on any of the protocols or areas of interest. So do get in touch with us if you think this would be of interest to your organisation or if there's any community organisations that are interested and um, we can work to set something up. I'll just quickly go through, as I said, this is just the first one in our series of putting into practice land rights and responsibilities webinars. So the second one is happens on Tuesday the 18th of August where we'll be looking at um, land ownership of private trusts and charities. Um, the third one we'll look into more depth on the diversification of ownership and tenure and negotiating transfer of land to communities. And then finally on the 1st of September this one will focus on good stewardship of land. So you can register on all of these now, just visit our website events page and follow instructions. And I think we can actually give, we're on 14.53, so we have five minutes more for any other questions if Emma has any lined up. I know there's been quite a few posed. Yeah, there's a couple more come in. So the first one is 
about compulsory sales orders and what's the, what the Commission is doing about compulsory sale orders? I think Gemma was going to answer that one. Yes, yeah, that's um, some work our policy and research colleagues um, picked up on a couple of years ago. Um, so the Commission did develop a proposal which was submitted to Scottish Government. Um, I think we'd hoped that might be picked up in the planning bill last year, but obviously there was a lot going on with the planning bill. Um, so that proposal is still sitting with Scottish Government and it's, it's for them to take it forward, but they have, um, they have said, I think quite recently, that that is something they intend to pursue. Okay, brilliant. There's another question from Judy, which is, what is the response of local authorities to templates and engaging with the review? Um, sorry. The review, what, Two. sorry, <laughs> the review of? Uh, it hasn't been specified, so I okay. think, but, but maybe in general, what's, in general, yeah, what's the response of local authorities to the protocols and the, the transparency template and so on? Okay. It's it's um, I mean we're we're working we're working with with landowners across the whole of Scotland and it does apply to local authorities as as well. I would say um, it's probably an area where we need to develop some some more dialogue and more conversations um, because we 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 haven't actually managed to speak to all the local authorities across all of Scotland yet um, and it, it will vary it depends on what local authorities particular interests are and where they are and what their own land holdings are um, but the protocols do apply to them as well so I mean I would say if, if people from communities have concerns that the, that the principles of the protocols aren't being applied by their own local authorities, then you can come to us with that and we can get involved in conversations around that and speak to um, individual local authorities or individual departments, depending on what the particular issue, issue is. Uh, but I mean, in terms of general public policy, local authorities have responsibilities for transparency and community engagement. Um, uh, and we, we hope that this will support the work that that a lot of them are already doing and we have actually found some some good examples again within our case studies there are some good examples and we're developing other examples of where local authorities have been involved in that as well. I just add to that Helen, point. sorry, sorry. Gemma. I was going to say I'll just add to that that we've got people from local authorities attending the webinar today which is fantastic to see. Mm. We're also at a really early stage with this so the protocols are still being published at the moment so we've got some published some about to be published and some which are a little bit further down the line and the, the uptake on that and the response to that has been really enthusiastic really positive some of you will have seen on twitter we had to extend the number of people we were allowed to take part in this webinar today which is really great so we're at early stage of that we're looking at different ways to support different organizations with implementing all of the protocols providing additional uh, tools and, and guidance to help people do that and make it as easy as possible for people uh, I was just going to pick up and say that it, it's worth bearing in mind in terms of transparency that under the Community Empowerment Act, local authorities and other relevant authorities are required to publish a register of their assets. So if there is um, a, a particular pu public body um, you're wanting to know what they own, they will have a register of those assets available for you to look at. That's most of the questions which, which relate fairly broadly. The other questions that have come up are quite specific. So I think we'll answer those through email following the, the session. So thank you everyone thank for you. joining myself and my colleagues today. Um, we hope you found this webinar useful and informative. So again, your feedback is really important. You will get a link to a short feedback form and it will be emailed to you as well. So please do complete this um, and send it back in. And also, as Emma said, please do get in contact if you require more information. So, for example, the questions that are more of a local context, please do get in contact with us directly. Our contact details are here and we can see what we can do to support and help. Um, and also, if you're interested in any of our self-assessments, our, our self-assessment pilot programme or um, workshops, again, do get in touch. Um, it's been a pleasure presenting to you today and just finish with wishing you good luck on all of your land rights and responsibilities journeys. Um, we'll hopefully see some of you at the next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you.